Sheridan's gone with me this morning. She got a head cold. But she'll be here the second hour, she said. The bathroom is our favorite friend right now. <laughs> <laughs> That's not a good place to hang out. That virus is not nice. We'll pray for her and the rest of that's a slippery slope. <laughs> Marty, I need to add somebody to our prayer list. Um, a lady I work with, her grandson was in a car accident Friday night, I think, and it broke his back. And he is permanently paralyzed. He's in his early twenties, and he was an athlete. Mm. And his name's Josh Thompson. Josh Thompson. Ruby just jot that name down so we can get it. Sure, Andrew, you guys don't keep up with it anymore, but did y'all listen to the Hart County game Friday night? They won with three seconds left, scored a touchdown. I expected Gary Gardner, the announcer, to be carried out on stretcher. Well, they only had 32 seconds to drive the ball out. Yeah, they got the ball 32 seconds left and down score. It was, it was good. I called Gary this morning to comment on it. Uh, WCLU had it where you could watch it. We did. I was oh, talking to Yeah, I went back and watched it. But I like listening to the radio, and I, but I like watching on YouTube if you can. <clears throat> I guess you can watch the sound off and listen to the radio. Sherry, is it his mother you work with, you said? No, it's grandmother. Grandmother. Anything else we need to announce? Do we still have our sick list on the screen? Well, the reason I, yes and no. I had been putting it up there. I thought some might not feel comfortable with their names broadcast. <coughs> you know. And, uh, but I need to get that back going. No one's really objected except, you know, didn't want to like if they were a home address or hospital or something or location. Yeah, and that's why I quit using it. I still actually had it up here. We'll go ahead and get started. And I, I may update that and see if anyone, I still have it, but I stopped updating it. I need to put that on there so we can do that at halftime between the two services. All right, we've got David and Alice listening. We'll go ahead and get started. It is 9 o'clock. It's good to have everyone here this morning. Sherry she be listening. Sherry's going to be listening. Oh, Rachel said, we're coming today. We're leaving Cave City. <laughs> I know it's a job probably for her. And, Three little ones. Well, good, Rachel. I hope I don't know if you're listening. All these texts are good. And uh, before I forget, Sherry asked us to remember in prayer a uh, lady she works with, her son, Josh Thompson. Was, grandson. 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 I just had asked you. Grandson was in a car wreck. He's in his 20s, permanently paralyzed. It broke his back. He'd been really active and athlete, so keep them in prayer. Where did it happen? I listen to a lot of local news, but probably wouldn't have heard there. But sometimes they report locally. So keep him in prayer, Josh Thompson and his family. <coughs> uh, don't forget, of course, our regulars on the list. I think I will. Jerry would ask about the prayer list. I think I'll get that going again. And if anyone doesn't want to be on there, I'll take them off. Because they're on the bulletin anyway, which is shown online. Maybe not quite as front and center. But uh, it'll help me, of course, continue to remember Alice with her, uh, you know, still got the kidney stones that had to be removed, but her regular pain, just a lot of suffering going on. Uh, Ken and Aaron, they've had colds, but doing all right. And I've got some others on there. Becky Hatcher, that's Wayne's wife. She's just not in good shape at all, enjoying a lot. Uh, Richard Conley, there's Aaron's father, uh, but they're moving to, uh, well, Arkansas. Rick Gibbs, I haven't heard any more from him, but I did hear from Elaine, Jerry's colon test looked good. They don't think there's any cancer. But they can't get to the place on his lungs, so they're going to do preventive radiation just in case. And, uh, of course, remember Lauren as she recovers as well. I think I will get the sick list back going because I've been sort of thinking about it. Ruby does help me to proofread the bulletin. I had in the here, in the time of Ezra, those who partook of this feast, I had, they had to be spiritually unclean. 
<laughs> and so Ruby said, "Did unclean? I said, well, that's supposed to be clean. I said, I'm glad you caught that. And uh, But I think I will get the sick list going. Still got a lot on here that have passed away. And, of course, Mom and Ruby's dad on there. But we'll, uh, I think I will this week rejuvenate that. And that'll give us something good to put up that people can look at between the two services. Sharon's not feeling well this morning. She's but plans on being here second half. Sherry Crabtree's not feeling well, so she's not with us. I'm just going to show once more for those that weren't here Wednesday night, uh, Kathy had gone to visit Mike's aunt because a lot of you didn't see. She was 102. That was the other day on her 102nd birthday. You know, not too awfully wrinkled, really, you know. Well, I mean, you expect 102. That's quite an accomplishment to make 102. Well, it is. And uh, Kathy said she's mostly at herself, isn't she? And I had comment. I remember her mother. When you remember people 102, remember their mother. You know you're getting on up there. But I remember her mother, and she really favored her. Sally was her name, Sally Goshen. Of course, married to Dilly. But anyway, I thought she looked really good. Is there anything else? All right. Got quite a, <coughs> looks like all lady group coming in this morning. All right, Larry's going to lead us in singing our first half, and then Stuart will our second half. And if I've forgotten anyone... Uh, please let me know. We'll turn it to Larry. <clears throat> Our first song this morning will be number 957. 957. <clears throat> This world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up, somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't collect hope in this world anymore. Oh Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then Lord, where will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't fill out hope in this world anymore. They're all expecting me, and there's one thing I know. My Savior pardoned me, and now I onwards go. I know He'll take me through, though I am weak and poor, and I can't that I have hope in this world anymore. Oh Lord, you know I have no friend like you. And if heaven's not my home, then Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't that I have home in this world anymore. Just up in glory land, we'll live eternally. The saints on every hand are shouting victory. There's so much sweetest praise, drills back from heaven's shore. And I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then Lord, where will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this war anymore. <coughs> <coughs> so, for the prayer this morning will be number <coughs> 709. After the singing of this song, 709, after the singing of this song, I will lead us in prayer. 709. <clears throat> How sweet and heavenly is the sight when those that love the Lord. 
in one another, speech, delight, and so fulfill the word. When each can feel his brother's side, and with him bear upon. When sorrow flows from eye to eye, and joy from heart to heart. When free from envy, scorn, and pride, our wish is all above. Each can his brother's failings hide and show a brother's love. When love in one deed life will stream through every bosom flow. When union sweet and dear is seen in every action glow. Love is a golden chain that binds the happy souls above. And he's in air of heaven who finds his bosom goes with love. <coughs> Would you bow with me? Our gracious Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for this beautiful day that you've given us this morning that we're so thankful father that we're able to assemble in your name without fear of mankind we're so thankful father for uh the great freedoms that we have in this country father we pray that we would always be able to worship and serve you without fear of mankind we're so thankful father for the uh good health that we enjoy this morning but we know father that there are many who are not here because of illness and father we pray that you would continue to be with them and bless them we pray father that you would uh continue to be with alice and if it be your will father that she would uh, be back with us soon and the pain that she has would be alleviated we're thankful father that lauren is uh, uh on her way to recovery and that you'd be with her father that she would continue to improve we pray father that you would uh, be with rick and if it be your will father that the uh a kidney failure that he has would be helped in some way, Father, that he'd be back with us. We pray, Father, that you would, would be with uh, uh, <coughs> Jerry, that uh, the treatment that he, has, that he will have, Father, would uh, take care of the cancer if it's uh, in his lungs, Father. We pray that you would be with him. Pray, Father, that you would be with the young man who has the uh, broken back from the wreck, that you would be with him and his family, Father, and bless them and, and heal them. Pray, Father, that you would continue to be with Sherry, that she would be back with us soon. We pray, Father, that you would, would be with Sharon, that she would uh, be with us soon. We pray, Father, that you would be with each of us as we study from your word this morning, that we can write divide your truths, Father, that we can... Uh, be instrumental, Father, in in uh, teaching each other, teaching others, Father, of your word. And pray, pray Father, that we would never uh, do or say anything, Father, that would cause others to doubt or to stumble or turn from you, Father. But help us to be strong and brave in our service to you. Help us, Father, to always stand up for those things uh, that we know that are right. We pray, Father, that you would be with this great country, that, that the... Uh, decisions that are made uh, by the leaders of this country father would be from you and be approved of you and father we pray that we can have a christian nation again pray father that you'd be with all those who are outside the fold of safety this morning that you'd be with them father those who have never rendered obedience unto you also those who have once been members of your body but have fallen away father that you would you'd be with them and bless them pray father that you'd help us this week to be good examples for you uh, wherever we go and whatever we might do, that we would live in such a way that those we come into contact would be able to see you living in us. Pray that you forgive us our sins, that you would strengthen us, that you'd have mercy on us, Father, and find in heaven and save us. Is our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. <coughs> Nine ninety one. <coughs> Nine ninety one. <coughs> Nine ninety one. <coughs> 
This is my father's world, and to my listening ears, all nations sing and around me rings the music of the spirit. This is my father's world, I rest me in the thought of rocks and trees, of skies and seas. And the wonders rock. This is my father's world. The birds their carols raise. The morning light, the lily white, declare their maker's praise. This is my father's world. He shines in all that spread. In the rustling grass I hear him pass. He speaks to me everywhere. This is my Father's world. Oh, let me never forget that though the wrong seems of so strong, God is the ruler yet. This is my father's world. The battle is not done. Jesus who died shall be satisfied and earth and heaven be one. Our song for the lesson this morning will be number two. Number two. <coughs> Number two. <coughs> we praise thee, O God, for the Son of thy love, for Jesus who died and is now gone above. Hallelujah, thine is glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine is glory. Revive us again. We praise thee, O God, for the Spirit of light who has shown us our Savior and scattered our night. Hallelujah, thine is glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory, revive us again. All glory and praise to the Lamb that was slain, who has for all our sins and has cleansed every stain. Hallelujah, thine the glory, hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory, Revive us again. All glory and praise to the God of all grace, who has bought us and sought us and guided our way. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. Revive us again, filling heart with thy love. May soul be rekindled with fire from above. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. Have classes, girls. Class. Go kind of silly, but I'm there by myself. Okay, we're in the book of Mark today. Let's 
still queued up from Wednesday night. Mark 15, 22 is where we're beginning today. Just a reminder, if you haven't ever subscribed to the church calendar on your iOS device, we do have a church calendar I try to keep updated. And so where we're at in the lessons, and, everything, and it also puts a link to the Wednesday night lesson. You can click and see the actual lesson uh, print out. Last week we closed out with one, Simon Serenian, who had been compelled to bear the cross of Jesus. We talked about that, and though the Bible doesn't say he fell beneath the load, as we sing in the song, Sherry Edwards had, I think, aptly pointed out that most likely he did to have to carry it uh, because he couldn't carry it. We read that just the cross piece of most Roman crosses weighed 100 pounds. The entire cross would have been about 300 pounds because they were tall, 9 to 12 foot. And uh, they were very heavy, and he had been beaten and blood loss, and he had been scourged, which is a terrible beating, and he just couldn't carry the cross. So this one, it's interesting the Lord included his name, but also his son's name here. There was a reason he had done that to memorialize them in the Bible. Uh, but had been compelled to carry his cross. Uh, carry his cross. So that's where we closed last week. I don't know if we'll finish today or not. It's 47 verses. So Jesus has just gone through, which is just a mock trial, beating. We learned that he was blindfolded during the beating. Uh, we know from Isaiah that they pulled out the hair of his face. And we talked about the thorns and the, the scourging was a terrible beating with like uh, strips of leather on a whip or a stick, you know, a whip made with that and often things would be attached to them that would cut to the bone. A terrible beating. And he, uh, no doubt, too, he was obviously too weak to carry the cross. And they bring him into the place Golgotha, which is being interpreted the place of the skull. The word Golgotha means skull. That's simply it. We don't know why. Some say that maybe it looked like it. Perhaps it was because of all the deaths that happened there in skulls. But it, that's what it, it means, Golgotha. I think it just, it is literally skull, uh, the Greek, uh, what it means. It literally means skull. Now they added here so called apparently because its form resembled a skull. Uh, I wouldn't have put speculation in the dictionary there, but uh, it does simply mean skull. And they gave him to drink <clears throat> wine mingled with myrrh, but he received it not. I think I've read that often this drink would have been used as somewhat of a mild sedative. Uh, wine, especially if it was alcoholic, mingled with myrrh. I looked up about this myrrh here. It actually reminds me of mirth, which means happiness. To mix and so flavor with myrrh. Wine with myrrh was wine flavored with it. The ancients used to infuse myrrh into wine to give it a more agreeable fragrance and flavor. But I'd read it might have been a mild sedative as well, uh, which nothing's going to take away the pain of the cross, but he refused this. He later on says, I thirst. And they brought him a sponge filled, but then some said, let him alone. And so they had given him this, but he actually refused this. Any comments? Just went into class here. AJ, you're needed. It's all girls. Let's get them in. Okay. Any comments on this about the drink wine mingled with myrrh? but he received it not. Whatever this was, he didn't want it. Especially if it had been some kind of sedative. All right, I've always been amazed at this next phrase. And when they crucified him, when they had crucified him, it just mentions it in just a few words there. But I guess there's not much else to say. Uh, they would crucify him. We've talked about in great detail the physical horrors of the cross, what that it would do to the body. And, you know, we don't have to look at that in detail, but obviously it caused a lot of 
it would disjoint you literally. And uh, I think there's references in the Old Testament to some of the things that would happen. And uh, to crucify was a terrible uh, death. I won't go over them all in detail, but I know a lot probably weren't here. Some of the things, uh, medical conditions of crucifixion. And uh, these are written from a medical point of view. This one, I actually had seen a list of all the things that would happen. And uh, crucifixion was horrible. The science of the crucifixion, this may have been it. Uh, there's the crown of thorns and the things that would happen. And uh, the accused need to be nailed while laying down. Uh, you, you had to. You couldn't put them up on a nine-foot cross and hardly nail them. It's talking about Jesus is thrown to the ground, reopening his wounds, grinding in dirt. Uh, they nail his hands. So I don't know what this word is. Patalubum. I had to keep a dictionary open. I'm not the most well-read person. It's what the crossbar of the crucifixion is. Well, just a side note here. Let me digress a little bit. It's fine to use that word, but I didn't know what it was. Since it's the crossbar of the crucifixion, if I'd been writing this, I probably would have put that. I try to write plain and simple so people can understand, not that I can use things. But uh, it just talks about the things that you normally couldn't breathe uh, during the crucifixion uh, very well because you had to push yourself up because the way you hung made it where that you couldn't breathe. And there was just so much... Uh, how fluids would gather and the such like. Are there any comments on this? It's reasonable to assume that Jesus was in good health prior, prior to the hours before his death, having been a carpenter and traveling throughout the land. Uh, he walked all the time. It says before the crucifixion, this was about 2.5 mile walk uh, to this. Huh. In parentheses, it says Edwards. I don't know who would have written that. wasn't me. Are there any questions or comments? We don't have to go into all the details uh, of this. But the physical things that were happening, was, it's, it's horrible. The things that did happen. Okay. Let's continue on. Just get with the text here. But when they had crucified him, it just that's why I even went into that. It, so much was done during this. I can't imagine being affixed to a piece of wood and then probably did it laying down. You couldn't already do it while they were on it. And then I'm just guessing. I doubt they dropped him gingerly into the hole and the, 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 the pulling would have been terrible. And of course, this was meant to kill people and it did, but it was excruciating many hours before death. Because you're nailed there, you can't hardly breathe. You've got probably spikes. I mean, they weren't little nails. They would have had to be more like spikes to hold the weight of a human body. They parted his garments, casting lots upon him what every man should take. So they actually gambled for what clothing he did have on. Most pictures of the crucifixion have Jesus with just a little loincloth. And it's probably done out of decency. I doubt he had anything on when they'd finished with crucifixion. Uh, if I look up Jesus' crucifixion and just some pictures here, uh, images, of course it's going to most have him drawn just, you know, with very little clothing on. And they may have left it like that. But it would have been terrible. But they gambled for his clothes. Isn't it interesting that a cross has become a symbol of something holy? And understandably so. If you look around, we probably, well, there. We, there's a cross above the attendance board. A little cross. If you can see, I don't know if we have one on this table or not. There's not one here. I know some communion trays have a cross for the handle. There's a cross there. There's a cross on the tract rack at the back. You perhaps have a cross somewhere on your Bible, especially if there's a bookmark or something. It'll often be a cross. If Jesus had been executed by the government today, what is the execution in Kentucky? 
how do we execute prisoners that are? Is electric chair in Kentucky? Well, let's find out. It's not a pleasant subject, I know. What is Kentucky's method of execution? Lethal injection. But you can, all right, before 98, you could choose electrocution. They use it as a backup, more or less. I don't know if anyone else hangs or not. I know Utah would shoot, but picture an electric chair. If Jesus had been crucified or executed today, would we have an electric chair up there above the attendance board? Or a lethal, you know, uh, syringe with poison in it? Or a hangman's noose? If Jesus had been executed... Uh, Jerry's talked about this before. One of the latest what it, hangings in Kentucky was here in Hart County, one of the later hangings, wasn't it? It was here at Mumfordville. And can you imagine if Jesus had been hung? Would we have a hangman's noose up there? I'm just saying, you know, those aren't pleasant images to think about. I imagine if Mary and John and some of the others, they came into worship. Why on earth do you have a cross up here? It's horrible. I don't even want to look at it. But it's become holy because of Jesus. But then again, that shows the power of Jesus. He can take something that was a horrible tool of execution and turn it into something that's holy and good because he died that way. Just things to think about. But they parted his garments, that is prophesied in Isaiah, that they would gamble for his clothing. Uh, Yeah, the cross is a symbol of love uh, that's shown. And I think it's a good thing to remember it that way. Uh, and the obedience. His obedience. It talks about the obedience of the cross. I was looking about the garments here. But uh, this had been prophesied. Wasn't it prophesied about that they were going to do his garments. I won't look up the exact verse right now. But they part his garments, casting lots, what every man should take. So the soldiers obviously gambled for his clothing. Can you imagine? I do think about that a lot. About, I wonder whatever happened to the clothing that he was wearing. It ended up with someone in their house. Would the cross be a symbol of uh, the of prophecy that was fulfilled? Well, which one? It said, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. Going back through the Old Testament, I'm just trying to think of examples of the prophecy of how he would be uh, sacrificed. Be I'm trying to think exactly how it's worded. Prophecy. But it talks about curses is every man that hung on a tree. Um, I'm just looking at some of the things here. They didn't want to tear his garment. I'm trying to think of any, there's so many prophecies of Jesus in the Old Testament. I think I've read there's over a thousand references. Uh, prophecies of Jesus. Psalm 22:18. Yeah, Psalm 22:18. Psalm 22, 16 is mentioned here about the dogs. What did you say? Psalm 22, 18? Yes. They part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. I was looking at Isaiah, but it was Psalms. Thank you, Larry. And so it had been prophesied. We just read Psalm 22 not long ago. So much of this is about the crucifixion. I think it would look good. It would do us good to look up some things about this, because Psalm 22 is probably one of the most written from a depressed and sad point of view. They gave up on me with their mouths and did. It says they shook their heads. Uh, I poured out and poured out like water. All my bo bones are out of joint. We had actually read that the bones would become, arms would become out of joint during a crucifixion often. 
uh, strengths died up, my tongue cleaved to my jaws. He was thirsty. Thou hast brought me into the dust of death. Uh, the assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierced my hands and feet. There's no doubt he's talking about the crucifixion here to come. I may tell all my bones. They look and stare upon me. Spread out like this. I'm sure Jesus wasn't a heavy man. He walked everywhere. It's the only choice, really. The only time he rode was the uh, donkey into Jerusalem that we know of. I may tell all my bones. They all look and stare upon me. They look and stare upon me. They part my garments among them, cast lots upon my vesture. And it goes on. And that is, it talks about the crucifixion here. But then suddenly, we go to Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. Probably the most positive psalm that there is. So the bright days come after the bad. Uh, of course, crucifixion is not mentioned in the Old Testament. But cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. Uh, referencing no doubt crucifixion here. But Stuart, to answer your question, I don't know if we have any references exactly how he would die or not. For he that is hanged, what's that? Excuse me. The reason I ask the question is because if it's a symbol of the prophecy that was fulfilled in the past, every time we look across it ought to be a reminder prophecy that will be fulfilled in the future. Well, it is. Of course, he was going to die. But crucifixion didn't come along until the Romans did. Uh, the Jews could execute, but only one way. What was that? They had to stop. And so, and in saying all that, the cross is a good symbol to us. It wasn't to them. But Jesus can take the worst symbol and make it something beautiful. But they parted his garments, cast lots upon them. They gambled for them. Whatever man should take. They, was in John said that uh, lest they, sh they didn't want to tear them. They didn't want to divide them. Uh, let me just see in John. They took his garments, made four parts to every soldier apart. Also his coat. Now the coat was without seam, woven from the top and out. They said among themselves, let us not rend it. They didn't want to divide it but cast lots for it, whose it shall be, that the Scripture might be fulfilled. They parted my raiment among them. So they took his clothes off and gambled for them. And it was the third hour, and it was the third hour when they crucified him. So about 9 a.m. roughly, they did it in the morning. All executions take place in the morning, usually a little after midnight in our society. It was the third hour, and they crucified him. And once again, just these few words, they crucified him. What is involved? It's terrible. It was a horrible method of death. And the superscription of his accusation was written over the king of the Jews. So they put this like, a, what he, like an accusation against him, the king of the Jews. And of course... Some say, uh, don't say he was king of the Jews, but what? That he said, I'm king of the Jews. Uh, the chief priest came to Pilate, this is John, write not the king of the Jews, but he said, I am king of the Jews. Pilate answered, what I've written, I have written. He left it up there. And it was accurate, the king of the Jews. And with him they crucified two thieves the one on his right hand and the other on his left. And the scripture was fulfilled which said he was numbered with the transgressors. And he was. He was just killed with other people that were, they were criminals. Uh, looked up numbered too much there, but he was numbered with the transgressors. Isaiah 53, 12. I was looking about these two thieves. We'll look later. It says they cast the same in his teeth. That, that's one I'll remember. Look up. In Matthew, the thieves, now the two thieves, one on the left, one on the right, he was in the middle, were crucified with him. So they executed thieves. Cast the same in his teeth. What? 
people were making fun of him. He saved others. Himself he could not save. If he be the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross and we will believe him. They wouldn't have. They had seen enough. He trusted in God. Let him deliver him now if he will have him. You see their sarcasm. For he said, see they knew, I am the son of God. They knew what that he said. The thieves also, which were crucified with him, cast the same as teeth. So Jesus was in the middle with two on the left and right, both making fun of him. But one repented, said, This man has done nothing amiss. And uh, one of them said, If thou be the Christ, save thyself and us. But his heart wasn't right, obviously. The other answering rebuked, he had to speak across Jesus because they were separated by Jesus, saying, Dost not thou fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation, and we indeed justly. And I know I'm skipping around, but I want you to get some of the other parts here. But this man had done nothing amiss. So he was talking to the other thief. But then he turns to Jesus. He had to still be looking that direction. And he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. Jesus answered and said to him, Verily I say unto thee, Verily is amen. I say unto thee. I love this passage. Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. This man had repented. His heart was right. It shows us it's not too late to turn to do right. This man was literally minutes, most hours from death. And he changed his heart. He believed in the Lord and asked Him to save him. And I've heard people say, I want to be saved like a thief on the cross. And what they mean is just to accept Jesus. But that was still under the old law. And... You know that man I talked to, and I don't know if he's still living or not in Hodgenville, the nursing home. I, he, he's the one that told me, he says, there's no use talking to me about the Bible. He said, I know it all. I said, well. And then I will, for context, he talked to me about the seven years of tribulation. I said, you know, that's not in the Bible. He said, yes, it is. I said, well, I know the Bible decently well, and it's not in there. He said, what kind of Bible are you reading? I said, King James. He said, well, me too. I had been asked to go see this man. He's very sick with cancer, but I'd forgotten. He, he said he didn't feel that baptism was necessary. And he mentioned the thief on the cross. Classic passing out baptism. Well, I told him, I said, well, that was first of all under the old law, not the new. Jesus hadn't died yet. And I said, how do you know he wasn't baptized? People were baptized under John. What was the purpose of John's baptism? Mark 1 tells us it was for remission of sins. Uh, John did baptize in the wilderness, preached the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Even John was baptizing for remission of sins before it was told on the day of Pentecost. I said, you don't know that he wasn't baptized. He said, oh, he wasn't. And I agree, probably wasn't. But you don't know it. You can't be saved like a thief on the cross. He was there with Jesus, asking Him personally. And Jesus had the power and authority to do this. And you don't want to be saved like a thief on the cross anyway. Why would you want to take that chance? I know. You're right, and that's a good point, Jerry May. Why would you want to take that chance? And, and people will argue, even beyond the grave. I saw that a preacher had died that did not believe in baptism at Mission of Sins. And his obituary, I guess he'd written it ahead of time or had his family put this, he said he went around baptizing people that had already been saved. And so he was making the point that he believed that baptism wasn't necessary. But I'd also say, <laughs> if they were already saved, why would you even bother with it? It's unnecessary. But baptism, we're told, saves us. I mean, you can't get any plainer than what Peter wrote. Uh, that baptism doth also now save us. The like figure for him to baptism. Is, the like figure is the water in the ark. Baptism doth also now save us. You can't be saved without it. The only way is to die before you become to knowledge of good and evil. Somebody like Maggie, of course we pray nothing like this happens, but if a two-year-old passes away, they've never been baptized, they're obviously saved. And uh, 
But whenever you start knowing right from wrong, it takes that. But I digress here a little bit. We don't have but a couple of minutes. All right, the scripture was filled which said he was number of the transgressors. You know, that is shame that Jesus was numbered with the transgressors. I know you've seen the classic numbering of prisoners. I hope no one thinks this is too light doing this, but something really sticks in my mind. Jerry will remember. Do you remember the criminals in Scrooge McDuck? They all had numbers on their chest. Uh, what was that called? The Beagle Boys, wasn't it? Uh, and the reason I'm mentioning this, look what they all have on their chest. Numbers. <laughs> There's their kind mother. <laughs> but they all have numbers. And a little bit more, obviously, infinitely more serious. The Jews had tattoos. Uh, from the Holocaust. I think I misspelled it. Uh, they had, see right there, the Jews tattooed the people in their camps to, uh, to remember, you know, keep up with them. 132238, you can still read it years later. Not to get too far off, but the last surviving cast member of Hogan's Heroes was Robert Clary. Uh, he just died the day after mom did, I think it was, or the day before. They died only one day apart. But he was in his 90s. He was on Hogan's Heroes. He played LeBeau, the little French cook. And in real life, he had a tattoo because he had been a prisoner, a Jewish camp, and he, he showed it. And uh, I just remember that stuck with me. That right there, I want to see if he has his, there's his tattoo right there, I guess. And, of course, he carried that to his grave. Uh, but they numbered prisoners to keep up with them. And Jesus was numbered with the transgressors. And so somebody somewhere had a list. And they had a number, and probably that date, of who was to be crucified that date, that day. And they at least had three on there. Whatever the other two's name was, then Jesus of Nazareth. Number, whatever they had. Number two between them anyway. He was numbered with the transgressors. All right, we are out. Are there any comments? Next week we'll pick up. We'll probably finish the chapter next week. About others railing on him, wagging his head. They were really making fun of him. I like when we get into Mark 16. The Sabbath was passed and it was the first day of the week. They came early to the tomb. And of course, the good news of this story was that Jesus rose from the dead. Now, here's another time they gave him a drink. They filled a sponge full of vinegar, put it on a reed, and gave him a drink, saying, Let alone, let's see. So it's not even really, you know, they didn't even want him to have this. They were cruel. And keep in mind, his mother was there watching. All right, went through verse 28. I digressed a little, but I wanted to point out some side things the cruelty of what was being done. And he was just a list of criminals among the people. He went to the lowest part of the human life, executed as a criminal, to be able to save us. But even then, sometime we'll have a lesson again. The seven Jesus only said seven things on the cross. Now, I know seven's no accident. He didn't say a lot. But you know, most of the things was for himself. We're out of time, but you know, that would be something to go over again. Are there any questions or comments while I knock on the door? Quite a crowd in there today. Since we're not doing class now, I want to see what when Robert Clary died. I know it was either the day before or after mom. November 16th. He was quite old. He was in his 90s. 
uh, died the day before mom. All right, Stuart, you got a second half scene?
Ruby, do you think Elliot? She looks so different. She looks good. Maybe you got some markers all over you. You feel like Eddie? Yes. He took the markers. She was carrying food when I went in, but she made some weight too. She does that a lot. She'll just come out and she'll go. Yeah, she'll go. Ruby, how was class? That's a lot of ages for
Still got a minute and a half. It is 10 o'clock. It's good to have everyone here. Have a good crowd. Ruby's fixing a few extra communion just in case. Uh, try, we try to gas a little bit. Continue to remember our sick. Of course, Alice still has kidney stone surgery pending, but her regular pains that she suffers so much to keep her in prayer. And Lauren's doing quite well, or certainly improving. She'll be going to work. You know, a few days when she works from home, medical, I think, uh, like x-ray reading, she's able to do from home, fortunately. I hadn't heard any more from Rick Gibbs. Uh, Lane said they're listening this morning, but uh, Jerry, her husband, got a good report about uh, his colon and cancer. Don't think he thinks cancer there, but he's going to have preventive radiation for a place on his lung they can't get to, so keep him in prayer. And a lady that Sherry works with, her grandson, did you say Josh Thompson? It was in an automobile accident. He's in his 20s, broke his back. He's totally paralyzed. So keep them in prayer. Sherry's not with us. Crabtree this morning. She's not feeling good. Sherry's supposed to be with us. She hasn't been feeling good. And supposed to be here second half. Uh, don't forget, uh, of course, our services tonight at 5 will be continuing. Zachariah. I've mentioned to a few, this is way off, but I want to give you a heads up, see if everyone's good with this. Looking ahead, Christmas Eve and New Year's Eve are both on Sundays. And uh, we've done something similar before because I know, especially the 24th, a lot of people have family meals at night. And the 31st, I don't like to be on the road for sure after dark, New Year's Eve. But what I thought of doing, I mentioned a few and seem in agreement, and I, like everybody else, think it's all right. On the 24th, we have our more and the 31st, we have our morning services. Just take a break for lunch, go wherever you want to, McDonald's or whatever, and we'll come back at 1 o'clock, two hours later, and have our evening service. And then that would be our services for the day. And that's a ways off, December 24th and 31st. Well, I want to give everybody a heads up. We've done that before, something similar. Is there anything else that needs to be announced? I haven't. I'll let you mention that if you want to. Well, I'll just go ahead and mention preliminary. Stuart had talked to me about, and one of the things we, I think, you know, we try to help a lot of people here with our money, but one of the things we need to do is some evangelism. And uh, his uh, son 
who's a deacon at the congregation there where he's at in uh, Lexington. His wife and daughter were going down to do some, I guess, mission work in Honduras. Uh, the schools there will allow Bibles to be used in the classroom to teach and teach English. You can't ask for a better thing. And maybe we sponsor and give some Bibles. And we can <clears throat> sponsor a teacher there and teach and buy from the Bible for a whole year for $5,000. And or we could uh, maybe send them on the trip. I think it was like twelve hundred a piece, wasn't it, for mission work? That's not going to be until what next year, July, July of next year. But it's something y'all can think about. People we know that would be going to do some mission work. Stuart and I were talking. I'm too old to go do mission work now. It's not impossible, but it'd be hard to travel. And that was a very biblical thing to do. The church has been blessed, and so it's something to consider that uh, maybe buy some Bibles, help them financially to go. So everybody, if you want to, just talk to Stuart if you're totally against it. But I think, Or, you know, if you're for it, mention it. I think it's a good thing to do with our funds is some uh, mission work and the fact that the government will allow teaching in public schools from the Bible. Uh, you know, that will expose a lot of people. Is that pretty much it, Stuart? We've got another map from Alabama. Oh, you're talking about that. I thought we should share that with I thought you were talking about your mat. I know, I know. Uh, excuse me, I had the wrong mat. It's okay. And, uh, but the other one's mission work coming up in July. The other one, the hunters that come up here every November. We have talked with them about just having a special event. Uh, he said they just couldn't do it this fall. They were so busy. But next spring, they're talking about coming up on a Saturday. They're going to bring their youth group and probably tour around a little, maybe like Lincoln's Farm or something like that. And then Saturday night, we have a service, and we talk about it. I, Jerry and Sherry know, maybe like at their house, you know, fire pit and everything, have a devotion on a service, and like we did before, cook out and things like that. And then the next morning here on Sunday, all the young people conduct the service for us. They'll probably go back on Sunday afternoon. But that's going to be coming up in the spring. We'll talk with them. That's the one you meant to mention. That's what I was thinking. Well, forget I even mentioned the other one then. <laughs> I think that's a good one to mention too, though. And, you know, uh, we can do some mission work. Because the church, you know, we need to do some things like that and uh, try to spread the gospel. So just wanted to keep that in mind. A lot of little housekeeping there, but good things coming up, I think, for Mufferville. All right, Stuart's going to be leading us in singing. He's going to be leading our opening prayer. Oh, this is coming up. I need to mention this, starting in January. Some of the men had talked, and we, think, and we used to do this at Fairview when I was growing up is we'd actually plan out our services about a month ahead of time of who was going to pray, wait on the Lord's Supper. So I'm going to print up a sign-up sheet starting in January because we've got a lot of holiday stuff come up. And like I'll have January and I'll have the whole... Uh, we're just going to do Sunday mornings now. because, And then uh, we will... We'll get everybody in. We will post that sheet on the board, and if you want to lead a prayer or do Lord's Supper, just sign up for it. We think it'd be a little bit more organized. And also, help y'all think, this is something that you can do. So I'll start posting that in January. And if you want to do Lord's Supper that day, fill it out. Isn't that what we said? Something like that? And try to get a little bit more organized on that and get men ahead of time. You don't have anybody for today yet, do you? All right, who wants to wait on the Lord's table today? That's why we're going to have sign-up sheets. But they did. Taylor and Adam uh, both volunteered immediately. So we'll do Taylor and Adam. And uh, at the end of our services, we'll have Alan to dismiss us in prayer. All right, is there anything else? All right, turn it to Stuart. <clears throat> Believe it or not, there is a little bit of organization involved in keeping everything running as smooth as it does. I appreciate Marty taking care of these things. Well, let's start with 849 this morning. That'll be our first hymn. 849. We'll sing three verses of this. Eight forty-nine. Tis the blessed hour of prayer when our hearts slowly bend and we gather to Jesus. Our Savior and friend, if we come to Him in faith, 
His protection to share One mom for the weary Oh, how sweet to be there Blessed hour of prayer Blessed hour of prayer What a mom for the weary Oh, how sweet to be there Is the blessed hour of prayer When the Savior draws near With a tender compassion His children to hear When He tells us we may pass At His feet every care what a mom for the weary, oh how sweet to be there. Blessed hour of prayer, blessed hour of prayer. What a mom for the weary, oh how sweet to be there. At the blessed hour of prayer. Trusting Him we believe that the blessing we're needing will surely be seen. In the fullness of this trust we shall lose every care. What a bond for the weary, oh how sweet to be there. Blessed hour of prayer, blessed hour of prayer, what a mom for the weary, oh how sweet to be there. Number 722 will be our next hymn, 722. <clears throat> We'll sing three verses of this immediately before scripture reading and prayer. 722. Let the beauty of Jesus be seen in me. All this wonderful passion and purity may his spirit divine all my being refined, let the beauty of Jesus be seen in me. When somebody has been so unkind to you, some words spoken that pierces you through and through, think how he must be God. Spell up on every bar, let the beauty of Jesus be seen in you. From the dawn of the morning to close of day, in the example in deeds and in all you say, let your
As we assemble this morning, we're thankful for all that you've provided for us, for blessings of this life, for the spiritual things that we have, and also for the physical needs that you meet for us. Especially, we're thankful for the rain that we've received this week. Father, we pray that you would be with each of those that have been mentioned this morning that need your healing pains. We have several that are, are ailing and need comfort. We pray especially for the Thompson family that you would be with them this time of stress in their lives. We pray, Father, that you would be with each of us as we go through this hour of worship. Help us to improve and to grow and to do better in the future than what we've done in the past. We pray that you would forgive us of the times that we sin and we come short of what you would expect of us. Help us to be better Christians and ambassadors in this place that we might lead others to the gospel. Father, please forgive us our sins and give us a reward in heaven if it be your will. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. The Bible reads to be 2 Timothy 3, verses 16 and 17. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect and thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Right. Let's turn to 589. 589 will be our next hymn, Leaning on the Everlasting Arms. We'll sing three verses. Five eighty nine. What a fellowship, what a joy divine, leaning on the everlasting arms. What a blessed day, what a peace of mind, leaning on the everlasting arms. Majesty and throne. 
Mark, if you will, 876, where he leads, I'll follow. Ruby had fixed a few more communion cups, and quick math there shows that we do need them. We have a good crowd today. How many is here today, Ruby? 34, 35? Think 35. We'll do another tally. Well, we're getting pretty close to 40. Wouldn't take many more. Well, my moral math kicks in. Five more would be 40. <laughs> and so uh, we easily could do it. And so I don't think we've had 40 here but one time since I've been here in 31 years. But I'm glad everyone's here. Uh, we did have a lot of things to announce about our, our spring devotional with the group from Alabama. They're planning to come up and do that. It'll be a Saturday night event and then, to, then here Sunday. And I guess I spilled the beans early about the mission work, but I match we too many of them. And so... Uh, Y'all can talk to Stuart more about that. And what we'll probably do, of course, it, we'd have to do this not during a worship service, but sometime after our service, Matt said, or Stuart said maybe his daughter-in-law and daughter would come explain the work that's going on down there. They're going to Honduras. And the fact the government will let them use Bibles in public classes to teach, that's a big opportunity. Ruby's parents had been to, didn't they go to Honduras on some mission work, Ruby? I think it was Honduras. Or was it Costa Rica? Is down that part of the world, Costa Rica. And so it's a good opportunity for us. And it is very biblical to send others when you can't go yourself. I just, I can't go to Honduras. Uh, I guess technically I could, but I'd be, you know, it would be a hard trying trip. And, you know, I feel like I need to be here. So that, that's not until July, but we'll talk about helping them with that. And, you know, their expenses or going or some Bibles or sponsor a teacher for the year or any combination. Uh, thereof so we and the course of men keep in mind that I mentioned there the sign-up sheet I know that's a little new I'm gonna start that in January Stuart and I were talking because a lot of people travel and holidays and give everybody a heads up that we can sign up ahead of time if you want to do something and it'll be a week and then the, we're just gonna do Sunday mornings thought we'd try to get a little bit more organized and encourage people if you sign up then it'll remind you to be here as well we have such a good crowd today I thought John 20 would be a good uh, passage to talk about. Whenever someone missed the first worship service, turn, if you will, to John 20, 19. It's good to be here because uh, we are commanded to assemble, but not just that. This is the time that the only time I see most of you is here and uh, that we see each other. And that's just the, just the nature of it. But it's good to come together. But Jesus, and we talked about the crucifixion in John, Jesus had just resurrected from the dead. He rose on the first day of the week. Uh, as a matter of fact, we see early in the morning. Uh, Try to think exactly how it's worded, some of these. Uh, now, the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they came. And they found not the body of the Lord Jesus. So what we call Sunday, and I like to call it, and I do often the Lord's Day, because that's what the Bible calls it. We call it Sunday. I don't even know the word of the etymology of Sunday. I, I mean, it's obviously Sunday. Etymology of Sunday. I misspelled etymology. It means day of the sun. But you know, that is fitting that we have named it that. It obviously wasn't called that early. On I think uh, the Greeks just named it the Sabbath obviously had a name. And then first day of the week. But it's sort of fitting that we have named it Sunday because Jesus twice in Revelation refers to the bright and morning star. Revelation twenty two sixteen, I am the bright and morning star, which is the sun. And so it's interesting that the Lord's day 
in our language, we have chosen Sunday. You know, and I haven't, I don't know even if I've thought of that before because I'm not sure I've looked up the etymology, but it means day of the sun, which, which makes sense. So many are named things like that after false gods. But that same day at evening, so they came together on the first day of the week. This was the first Sunday, the first Lord's Day. Then the same day at evening, they didn't come together till night because he'd been resurrected that morning very early, being the first day of the week. When the doors were shut where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. I think another passage talks about the fear they had because they thought it was a ghost. I will uh, probably look at a little bit of cross-reference here uh, from Luke 24. Uh, some of these things. He vanished out of their sight. And he appeared, Jesus stood in the midst of them and said to them, Peace be unto you. They were frighted. They were terrified and frighted and thought they'd seen a spirit. The doors were shut. It seems that he just appeared there. And obviously Jesus could do this. And he said, first thing he said was peace. That's a very interesting uh, way that he greeted it. And of course, his resurrection from the dead Peace on earth, goodwill toward men. The first words he says to the assembled group, their first Lord's Day was peace. But they had come together and the doors were shut because they were afraid. Our doors are shut here, but we really don't have to be afraid of a government group. We do use caution because there's been, you know, church, church shootings and worship service in the past, uh, recent history, and we do keep a watch. And so there is precedent. They were there and the doors were shut for fear of the Jews. But Jesus came and stood in the midst of them and said to them, Peace be unto you. And obviously Jesus is in the midst of us as well. And when He had so said, He showed unto them His hands and His side. So then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. So at first they thought it was a spirit. Uh, he just had appeared apparently and he asked him, why are you trouble? And he said, now also we learn from this Luke 24, behold my hands and my feet. There's myself. Handle me. Jesus touched a lot of people. He said, handle me. But there's one I want to look up. I don't want to get too far off. And I don't really know the answer to this, though I have some speculation. Whenever in the Garden of Gethsemane, ah, uh, that in John, we'll look up in verse 20, Mary, when she saw Jesus, she was weeping. She thought He was the gardener and asked, if you've taken Jesus somewhere, tell me where. Jesus sent her Mary. She would have recognized His voice. She turned herself and sent Him Rabboni, which is a master. So apparently from the context, she was grabbing Jesus, hugging Him, or something like that. Or whatever obviously was appropriate to do. And uh, just, you know, you see someone you haven't seen in a long time, especially if you thought they'd been dead. You're going to embrace them and hold them. Jesus said, touch me not. I've often wondered why he said that, because later on here he said to the disciples, uh, after he had seen them, handle me, touch me. Why did he say this to Mary? Could have been a couple of reasons. One, you don't have to, I, I haven't left yet. But also, I don't know if this has anything to do with it or not. They were in the transition from the old law to the new. Where would she have been touching him? I mean, what, phys what location on earth? In a cemetery, a graveyard. Maybe his grave clothes having been in a tomb. You couldn't touch anything to do with the dead. And that's probably, I feel like, why he said, touch me not. I've not yet ascended to my father. He may have still had on clothing that would have been unclean. And this would have made her unclean. They still were technically under the old law, although it was transition period. I don't know. But he said, touch me not. I'm not yet ascended to my father. And so, back to the original verb, but he did invite them to touch him. Handle me. They, they wanted to touch Jesus. So he showed them his hands and his side. They would have been pierced from nail scar. I mean, spikes probably through. And he still had the wounds. And because he was going to show them. Jesus resurrected from the dead. Obviously, he could have removed his wounds, but he kept them. He showed, you know, showing that it was him. It's not just a look-alike. Uh, this is someone who had been pierced. He showed his hands. 
I was listening to this, the, or on his side, I was listening to this the other day, and this shows something about the clothing of the day. I've often pictured them wearing robes that just come in over their head. He couldn't have done that and showed his side easily. They probably had something that opened up. You know, maybe, maybe we would picture a bathrobe that comes across, and he could open it up enough to show his side. So he showed his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Then Jesus said to them again, Peace be unto you. So once again, he sends peace unto them. As my Father has sent me, so send I you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. The apostles could already do amazing things. They could raise the dead even. And... Various things. Once, remember some of the apostles when a village went and received Jesus, they asked, do you want us to call down fire from heaven and destroy them? They had that ability. He said, you don't know what manner of spirit you are. I didn't come to destroy people's lives, but to save them. He chastised them for this. But that's not all that he did. He did something that I would really enjoy. Let me read one more verse. He tells them, whoever sins you remit, they are remitted unto them. And whosoever sins you retain, they are retained. They had the power, it seems, to forgive and to retain the sins of people, people that would not repent. Uh, they were given great power as the apostles. A lot of this we might not understand, but they had the ability to forgive sins because it says here. But also, as you see in the account, let's go to Luke's account, uh, whenever he said he showed them his hands and his feet, and yet while they believed not for joy and wonder, he said to them, Have you any meat? Uh, I always, I often think of Sandy when I read this verse. Do you know why, Sandy? Well, it's about eating, but not just that. But after Jesus was resurrected, he, he said, do you have anything to eat? Sandy, have you ever had anyone come in? I'm sure Chris came in and got any food or anything. Raid the refrigerator. And uh, they gave him a piece of a broiled fish and a honeycomb. The reason I mentioned Sandy, she told me, she said, I always picture Jesus as a spirit after his resurrection. Do you remember that? Does that ring a bell now? And that I'm glad you said that because he, he was still in his body. He had holes and scars. He was hungry. They gave him broiled fish and honeycomb. He took it and did eat before them. And so, he said, these things that are written of me, and it says also, let me look this up here. One of the things he gave them, because they didn't understand everything, it says, Luke 24, then he opened, then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. I thought about that and I should have gone down a little bit further, but this highlights it for you. One of the things Jesus gave them, he put miraculous knowledge in their mind. He opened their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. They didn't have access to the word the way that we do. It was scrolls here and there and it was hard to no doubt get them together and read. We're so blessed with having the Bible electronically today where we can have entire Bibles, libraries, volumes on our phones even. He opened their understanding so that they would understand the Scriptures and they knew what was being taught. But he tells them all these wonderful things the first, first day of the week. But look at the next verse. But Thomas one of the twelve called Didymus was not with them when Jesus came. Where on earth was Thomas? Where was a better place to be than with the apostles? Look at how much he missed out on by not being with them that day. He wasn't with them. And it says Thomas called the twin. Of course, he doubted about Jesus. We'll talk about Didymus means twin, and so does Thomas. But uh, Didymus, we get ditto from. You know, we often use that. I think I want to go get something to eat. Ditto. That means I do too. And so Didymus was his name. But he wasn't there. Where could he have been? What was he doing at this moment? Oh, how much he missed out on. And so they saw him during this week. The other disciples therefore said to him, We have seen the Lord. So they were excited to tell him because he missed services that first time. We have seen the Lord, but he said to them, except I shall see the hands and the print of the nails. Looking back, if he'd been at service number one, what would he have seen? He, that's what Jesus showed. Except I shall see 
his hands in his hands the print of the nails and put my finger in the print of the nails and thrust my hand into his side. I will not believe. Jesus had taught about his resurrection, but Thomas had three criteria. Unless I can see the nail prints in his hands and I touch them and thrust my hand in his side, I will not believe. So it took a week after eight days. Now Jews counted a week as eight days. Sunday to Sunday was eight days. Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. That's eight days. Because they counted both of them. And after eight days again, his disciples were within and Thomas with them. He wasn't going to miss out this time. But he had to go a whole week without seeing Jesus. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace be unto you. Once again, he said the same thing. He knew of Thomas's doubting. Then said he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger and behold my hands. So Thomas had three criteria. He won't believe until he can see his hand, touch it, and touch his side. Three things. See, touch, and touch. So Jesus told him, Reach hither thy finger, you know, touch, and behold my hand. See them. That's the first two Thomas asked for. He had asked to touch his side. And reach hither thy hand and thrust at my side. Here, feel. And be not faithless, but believe it. So Thomas had three things that he wanted to do before he would believe Jesus had resurrected. Jesus answered all three right here. Be not faithless, but believe it. And Thomas answering and said to him, My Lord and my God. He just totally believed. And I don't want to be too critical of Thomas for not believing. He should have. Thomas, we call, as a matter of fact, because of this doubting of Jesus' resurrection, everybody in our society knows if you really doubt something, they call you a doubting what? A doubting Thomas. He's forever, if I just Google doubting Thomas, uh, I mean, that, that's a standard word. Huh? It is a euphemism. A doubting Thomas is a skeptic who refuses to believe without direct personal experiences on Wikipedia. A reference to the Gospel of John here. And so, he is forever known as doubting. But don't be too hard on him. And the reason I say that, he was willing to die with Jesus. But one of the reasons he may have doubted, first of all, to say we've seen someone that's deceased. If someone came and told me, I saw your mom in Mumfordville. I had to admit I would doubt. Uh, are you sure you didn't see someone look like her? She died last November. And But Thomas, still though, Jesus had talked about his resurrection. We would doubt on some things that are so amazing that it's hard to believe. Here's a person who had been crucified, the most heinous way to be put to death. And they said, we just saw him. He doubted. Also consider Thomas's name. It means twin. Thomas means twin, and Didymus means twin. Uh, you look it up, Thomas, uh, it means literally a twin. And Didymus, look it up, it means twofold or twain. It means two. And so, almost surely from his name, he probably was a twin. And if someone said, Thomas probably went through all this, I just saw you at Samaria, didn't I? No, it was probably my what? Twin. I remember, y'all remember when Jewel Watkins attended here. Uh, she's since gone. She had a twin sister, and she's also passed away. But she said, when she was young, she went to Greene County Fair. She said uh, her sister was married, and she was not. And she was there with another man. She, someone really approached about, what are you doing with this man? You're married to so-and-so. It's not me. It's my twin sister. They didn't know she had a twin. They were identical. And that could really get you into some trouble. And so Thomas almost surely was a twin. So he probably had spent his whole life saying, no, that was my brother. You didn't see my brother. Or you saw me. Or vice versa. And saw Jesus. Well, I think it's probably someone that looked like him. Are you sure? That's probably one of his reasons of doubting. But also John eleven sixteen. 16. Uh, Whenever Jesus was getting ready to resurrect Lazarus, in John eleven sixteen, I'll go back a little earlier. Let's just look at about twelve. Uh, 
Lazarus had died and Jesus said he sleeps. They thought, I must go and wake him out of sleep. He was dead. His disciples said, Lord, if he sleep, he shall do well. I like the way Jesus answers them in verse 14. He had died and he, he said, I'm going to go awaken him out of sleep. Howbeit Jesus spoke of his death. But they thought he had spoken of taking of rest and sleep. Then Jesus said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead. He didn't use any euphemisms or parables or anything then. Lazarus is dead. And I'm glad I wasn't there. If he'd been there, he could have stopped it. He could have anyway. But he said, I'm glad I wasn't there. You ever thought of Jesus saying, I'm glad I wasn't there to help with this? Because it made more people believe. To the intent that you may believe. Nevertheless, get, let us go to him. Then said Thomas, which is called Didymus, unto his fellow disciples. They were afraid to go back here. Let us also go that we may die with him. It's sort of a shame that we say doubting Thomas when he was willing to die with Jesus. When the others didn't say this. So, be a little bit maybe in our hearts. I'm talking about kinder to Thomas. Uh, don't just think of him doubting. But he said, my Lord and my God. And then, Jesus addresses us, if not by name, what we do. Jesus said unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet believed. That was every one of us. Uh, I'm going to read two more verses. And many other signs truly did Jesus do in the presence of His disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through His name. I think I will go a little bit further. Jesus showed Himself again. Thomas was so, I mean, J uh, Peter was so impetuous at the things he did. Jesus, uh, they had been fishing, and Simon Peter and the others, they were there fishing, and they had gone out, they went to a ship, and the next morning, Jesus stood on the shore. The disciples didn't know it was Jesus. He said, children, have you any meat? They answered, no. And he told them to cast the net on the other side of the ship. Such a lesson here. And so the disciple whom Jesus loved, most think this was John, said, it's the Lord. And so Peter cast off his clothes, jumps into the sea, and, uh, you know, to go to Jesus. And they dragged all these fish in uh, that they had. And so whenever they come to land, they saw a fire there and fish laid on and bread. So Jesus was there, had a meal prepared for them whenever they landed. There's such lessons in that. But uh, they caught 253 fish. It's interesting, some of the details of the Bible tells us. There were so many, yet the net was not broken. But what I, the reason I went on to this chapter, there's the third time we see here that Jesus has showed Himself to His disciples. First Lord Day, second Lord's Day, and then here fishing. We learn from Acts, He only appeared to people chosen by the Lord. But Jesus did so many things. I want to get to the end of the book here. And there, this is the last chapter of John, the last verse of John. And there are also many other things which Jesus did, the which, if they should be written, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. Amen. Probably no doubt an exaggeration, but Jesus did so many things. He said, I doubt the world could hold the books if we wrote them all down. And so, so many wonderful things He did. But the whole point of the lesson, think about what Laz or Thomas missed out on by not being the first day of the week. And whenever we're not here, we do miss out. Being each other, the class that was taught. If I were to teach on Zechariah 4, which I'm going to tonight, uh, I'm, I probably won't go over Zechariah 4 for a long time. Again, next Sunday evening if you miss... And of course, I know you can listen, but Zechariah 5, was that the chapter that talks about the flying roll? We'll talk about that, Zechariah 5. And so many of these things, not that my lessons are from a great order, but they're from the Word of God. But most of all, we're in the presence of the Lord when we're here. But I wanted to actually give this, when I saw so many were here, I thought this would be a good time. I appreciate you being here, and I encourage you to be here as much as possible. So your children will learn, so they'll hear the songs, so they'll be exposed in class. And I know they don't listen to me preach, probably at all. Grace, what did I just say? See? Good example. See, what are you listening? I don't expect you to. I understand. 
Grace caught her attention though, didn't it? Sorry, Grace, to use you as an example. But you hear things along the way. You know, uh, songs that are sung. It's amazing to me how early that kids start singing the songs. Of course, Ruby's taught music practically since Bach wrote songs. It seems like she taught music for 34 years in the public schools. And music really does reach children. Uh, I've seen Caden sing the songs that we do. I can remember when Patrick was little. For a while there, Patrick, when Patrick was here, I wouldn't sing Holy, Holy, Holy because he would go berserk. He would stand up and jump up and down in the seats, and I had to quit the song until he grew up a little bit. Will Patrick be here today? No. All right, we'll sing Holy, Holy, Holy. <laughs> of course, I'm just kidding, more or less, but he did get animated here in Holy, Holy, Holy. And that's good because the songs reached him. Songs reach the kids. I think that's one of the reasons the Lord wanted singing in our worship. They're too young to understand these words, especially if I get talking about Greek. But they know songs. They learn the tunes. They can hear things about Jesus and learn these things. So let's not be like Thomas. We might miss something wonderful. In a moment, we're going to sing the song. What was it, Stuart? Where He leads me, I will follow. Where He leads me, I will follow. Follow wherever He goes. Worship services, at work or at home. Because Jesus has something wonderful to say to us and show to us like He did Thomas. If you're here and need to obey the gospel or online listening, turn to the Lord. Certainly believe on Him. Don't be doubting the way Thomas was. I know he believed, but he just couldn't hardly imagine that. Uh, believe on the Lord. Turn from your sins and repentance. Confess His name. Then be baptized, which is a submersion underwater that washes away our sins. If you've done that and left the Lord, ask Him to forgive you and come back. He has simple terms for an eternity to be with Him in heaven. If you need to respond, do so as we stand and sing. I can hear my Savior calling. I can hear my Savior calling. I can hear my Savior calling. Take thy cross and follow, follow me. Where he leads me, I will follow. Where he leads me, I will follow. Where he leads me, I will follow.
And thank you for your many blessings. Thank you for this opportunity to partake in the Lord's Supper. Uh, just to remember your sacrifice on the cross and we partake of the bread. And in Christ's name, Amen. Father, thank you for this day. Um, please help us to partake of the blood that through the vine, remember your, the blood you shed on the cross for us. In Christ's name, amen. Well, dear Lord, we come to you in prayer to thank you and to give back to you, Lord. For we take this time to give back financially that we can still worship freely. freely. In Lord's name, God's name.
in a moment, Stuart will lead us in a closing song. It was Alan, did I call upon you for the closing prayer? Uh, don't forget our services this evening at 5 p.m. We'll be looking at Zechariah 4. The best we can count, we had 35. Anyone else get another number? If you did, let us know. Uh, but uh, it's a good crowd. Is there anything else? Appreciate each one coming. We haven't got to see Elliot since her surgery, and so well, they did a great job on that. About her hip and arm. She's got her palate uh, surgery coming up. When's that going to be? Um, we don't see her whole schedule So they said that'd be a lot more involved. So keep her in prayer. She looks good. Looks like she feels good. If there's nothing else. Let us thank. We'll turn to 650 for our closing hymn. We'll sing the fourth verse, number 650. Fourth verse. <coughs> Let us not grow weary in the work of love. Sing the light, sing the light. Let us gather jewels for a crown of glory. Sing the light, sing the light, sing the light. The blessed gospel light. Let it shine from shore to shore. Sing the love, the blessing gospel light, let it shine forevermore. Lord, we thank you for this day you have given us. We especially thank you for the rain over the past few days. We ask, Lord, that you be with those that are in sick or in need and be with us as we carry out our day. We ask you to bring us back together safely tonight. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.